Welcome to uh, UNH School of Law. Uh, my name is Erin Corcoran, and I'm a professor here at the law school and also the executive director of the Warren B. Rudman Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. Um, the Rudman Center was launched at the law school this past April in, to commemorate the life and work of Senator Warren B. Rudman. Um, Rudman, representing the state of New Hampshire from, for two terms in the U.S. Senate prior to going to Washington, also served as the Attorney General for New Hampshire, where he quickly became uh, uh, a champion and acknowledged for his efforts to professionalize the Attorney General's office. Um, he is often most remembered for his pugnaciousness, his grit, and his ability to form consensus around vexing and controversial issues facing the nation. He dedicated his life to, public, to the public and took very seriously these responsibilities as an elected official. He put this value um, first and foremost and even above his own party's politics. Um, his hope for this center, he was very actively involved in the, center, in the creation of the center before he passed away, was twofold. Um, one, to provide training and support to students who wanted to pursue careers in government service and the public interest. And also to, to provide a much needed space for discourse, discussion, and civil disagreement about national issues of our time. So tonight, the Rudman Center is proud to serve as a co-host to a debate about the appropriate role of money in politics. We have two distinguished um, guests, both who have dedicated their careers to serving the public good. We have um, John Hunt, uh, who's a legislator for New Hampshire, who represents the cities of Fitzwilliam and Rhine. He was um, elected, Ringe? Ringe. I apologize. He was elected to, first into office in 1986. Um, and we have John Bonifant, who's the executive director and co-founder of, of Free Speech for the People, and he has spent his career um, on protecting voting rights and ensuring access, equal access to the polls. He was a 1999 MacArthur Foundation Fellow. Um, I also just wanted to take a moment to recognize we have several members from the New Hampshire legislature who are here present in the audience, which we're really, truly glad to have you here at the law school here tonight. Um, tonight, these gentlemen are going to discuss and debate what is the appropriate role of money in politics. And before I turn it over to them, I thought I would just provide a little bit of background um, as a starting off point on the Citizens United case, which is going to serve as the, the central talking point for, the, for this discussion. Um, this is a case in which the Supreme Court um, found a provision in the, um, that is commonly referred to in the McCain-Feingold Act as unconstitutional. The provision that they found unconstitutional basically prohibited um, airing electioneering communication as a broadcast cable or satellite about a candidate um, within 60 days of the general election or 30 days of a primary. Um, Citizens United was an organization that wanted to air commercials about a film, Hillary, the movie, um, and they were prohibited from doing so within that, that, that time leading up to the primary. Um, and so the issue before the court was whether or not the, this organization had any right, right, any First Amendment right to speech as an organization, um, because clearly individuals can say what they want about a candidate at any point in time. Um, but this was a, an issue about the, the prohibition on the organization. Um, and what the court did say is that um, free speech rights apply to corporations, associations, and unions just as they do to individuals. Um, what this decision did not do was um, remove any, uh, any limitation on the amount of money that an individual or organization could give to a candidate. Um, this had more implications for how much um, money could be given to um, political action committees. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to these guys. I don't know who would like to go first. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Aaron, uh, for hosting us here at the Warren Rubin Center. Uh, we are pleased to be here, and I really want to thank Representative Hunt for participating My in pleasure. this debate. Mm -hmm. I think we have a, a vibrant democracy only when we have these open and honest kinds of debates, and I really thank you for joining in this conversation. And thank you all for, for being here. I do want to just uh, start out with an acknowledgement to Marion Hunt, Representative Hunt's sister, who initiated this idea and brought us uh, together to do this. And I also want to acknowledge uh, my aunt, State Representative Mary Cooney, who's here tonight with my uncle Michael and my cousins, Jamie and Nick. I, I am uh, a connected person to New Hampshire, though I may not live uh, here. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts. But um, it's uh, very helpful to have Representative Cooney's leadership 
in the state legislature along with Representative Perry, Representative Weed, and others who have been leading this effort for the call for a constitutional amendment to overturn the Citizens United ruling and to reclaim our democracy. Uh, you know, what I want to do at the outset here is, is talk about the danger that we face today with not just the Citizens United ruling, but the overall threat of big money dominance of our elections and corporate dominance of our government. Citizens United is uh, a critically important ruling and a dangerous one for two reasons. One, it exponentially makes worse the problem of unlimited campaign spending. A problem that predates that decision that goes back to a 1976 Supreme Court ruling known as Buckley v. Vallejo, which equated money with speech and set us on this course of unlimited campaign spending. But it, it now enables corporations, which are artificial creatures of the state, to unleash unlimited corporate dollars uh, into our elections. So we have taken a system that was a danger to our democracy prior to Citizens United, and we made it far, far worse, where now these creatures of government, uh, and in this case, the largest multinational corporations, having billions of dollars at their disposal to influence our elections, a, a direct and serious threat uh, to the political process and to the promise of American democracy. The second problem out of Citizens United, equally uh, important is the idea that corporations should be treated as people with constitutional rights. Now this is not an idea that came about only because of Citizens United. It in fact has been a doctrine that has been eroding our First Amendment and our Constitution for the past 30 years, dating back to an infamous memorandum written by then private attorney Lewis Powell, writing for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce back in 1971 arguing how corporate America could respond to the growing number of public interest laws getting passed during that era to protect our environment, our health care, education, civil rights, and our elections. And the response that Lewis Powell created, in, again in this secret memorandum never to see the light of day, was to have corporate America go into federal court and argue that they had a free speech right, corporations have a free speech right that trumps these public interest laws, that these public interest laws violate the free speech rights of these artificial creatures of the state. And we've seen actually, in the course of, of the use of this doctrine in federal court, uh, we've seen public interest laws getting struck down on this free speech argument. Neighboring Vermont, the legislature there in the 1990s passed a law barring the uh, rather requiring labeling of the use of the bovine growth hormone drug. A Monsanto created a drug which was designed to increase arguably efficiency in milk production, but there's only one problem. It had serious health effects for humans as well as animals and it was being banned throughout the world. Australia banned it, Europe banned it, Canada banned it. Large parts of the world had already banned it. Here in this country it was fast tracked by the food and Drug Administration allowed for use in our dairies across the country. So organic dairy farmers joining with citizens in Vermont said, well, if we can't ban it, let's at least require labeling so that people in the state of Vermont can make a choice, uh, an informed choice, as to whether or not they want to buy milk products from a dairy using this dangerous drug or whether they want to buy it from one of the many organic dairies in the state of Vermont. And that law uh, passed the state legislature and then Monsanto and the Industrial Dairy Association took the state of Vermont to court, to federal court, saying they had a free speech right not to put these labels on their products, that their free speech right was being violated. And they won. The federal court struck down that Vermont law on this false free speech argument. But Citizens United is the most extreme extension of this fabricated doctrine of corporate constitutional rights because it now allows corporations to invade our political sphere and effectively take over our democracy uh, and our government. Uh, now with respect to the problem of unlimited campaign spending, just to come back to that uh, for a moment, it is also important to understand that this is not solely a, a question of the danger of corruption 
that comes with big money interests trying to influence our government at the federal or state level. Fundamentally a question of political equality. Because at the end of the day, we are all in a democracy supposed to have an equal and meaningful vote. And that includes equal and meaningful participation in the entire election process, not just on election day. And today's campaign finance system, now with the Citizens United really making it even worse, has effectively created a wealth primary where those who have access to wealth are able to effectively shut out ordinary citizen voices. When we take a look at the kind of money coming in to our political process through this, through this campaign finance system, we see that the top 1%, both in terms of corporate interests and big money interests, are the ones that dominate the political giving. It's not the $5 donor, it's not the $25 donor, it's these big money interests that dominate uh, the giving. And that is, I think, what is so dangerous as well to this promise of political equality for all. So that's why we've joined with the Coalition for Open Democracy. I know Olivia Zink is here who directs that, and Representative Perry's on the board and others, and we've joined with Public Citizen uh, and, and other allies here in New Hampshire to have New Hampshire become the 17th state calling for a constitutional amendment to both overturn Citizens United and Buckley v. Vallejo to make clear that we the people rule, not we the corporations, and that when it comes to our authority as people to ensure a level playing field, that includes reasonable limits on campaign spending. Sixteen states have already passed this kind of an amendment resolution. 500 plus cities and towns across uh, the country. Uh, 125 plus members of Congress are on record for it, as is the President of the United States now. And, you know, I do want to invoke uh, Warren Rubman uh, uh, in this debate because he said soon after Citizens United, he wrote a piece for the Washington Post in which he uh, said that the laws limiting corporate money in federal elections and requiring strict disclosure of campaign funds were dealt a serious blow by the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United. He went on to write, Supreme Court opinion notwithstanding, corporations are not defined as people under the Constitution, and free speech can hardly be called free when only the rich are heard. This is not a partisan question. This is not an issue that only appeals to people on one side of the political aisle. Warren Rubin, of course, was a long-standing Republican leader in this country and a, a member of the of U.S. Senate for many years. And, and, and he has that view shared by many other Republicans uh, in this country. We've actually done some polling that shows that 68% of Republicans oppose the Citizens United ruling and believe there should be an amendment to make clear that corporations are not people with constitutional rights. And if that's not enough of proof of the cross-partisan opportunity we have in this amendment fight, take a look at the ballot initiative campaign that we ran with Common Cause in Montana back in last November. You know, 55% of the voters in that state voted for Mitt Romney to be president. 75% voted for our ballot initiative to call for this very kind of constitutional amendment. So this is a moment where we, as a people, can unite around a common vision. We may not agree on, on a number of policy issues, but we can unite around that common vision of government of, by, and for the people not of, by, and for the corporations and, and the very rich. And we urge those in, here tonight to join this movement to reclaim our democracy. Thank you. Well, <laughs> obviously I have a different opinion. When uh, my sister called me up and said uh, that about this decision and how she wanted a constitutional amendment, and I go, on the Citizen United decision? I said, do you know what that decision was really about? This decision did not, did not mean corporations can give money to candidates. How many people knew that when they took the survey? Most people hear that and they think this means unlimited spending by corporations to candidates. The decision had nothing to do with that. This decision simply said that it's okay for Fox Network to run outrageous storylines 
60, 30 days before a campaign. But you could not put a TV ad together and run that ad if you are an entity. So you as an individual, you can write a letter to the newspaper. You can post something on the web. The question is, if somebody says, well, I think we need to respond to this negative attack, and we need to put together an infomercial, that that infomercial, I guess, to comply with McCain-Feingold, has to list all the donors in the ad. But if the donors are a trade union, the donors are an LLC, a small family corporation that wants to respond to something they see, any individual, if you would set, if you're putting that money into a business, that's what's illegal. That's all this decision's about. So when my sister called me up and says, "Well, don't you think we need a constitutional amendment?" I go, "Oh no." No, we've been down this path before. She says, what do you mean? Well, as you heard, I've been a legislator since 1986. I was elected in 86. In 1987, my very first legislative year, freshman, the Supreme Court always makes these decisions in June, right? End of the, end of the session. They make the big controversial ones in June. The Supreme Court came down and said, it's okay to burn the flag. That is a form of speech. Freedom of speech included flag burning. Well, needless to say, the legislature, this was the, literally the last days, we were wrapping it up, we were trying to get home, was outraged. And they, we gotta do something about that. We need to do something about protecting the American flag. And so immediately we whipped up a resolution and drafted up and brought, we passed, we bypassed all the rules, no committees, we're just gonna pass this thing right away, uh, urging Congress to pass a constitutional amendment to protect the flag. That was 26 years ago? Have we got the flag burning amendment yet? No. And the reason why we don't have a flag burning amendment is you can't put an asterisk to freedom of speech. Can't. The United States, we're one of the, my, my understanding, and I, I, you know, I'm not a constitutional expert. A lot of other people know a lot more about constitutional in the legislature than I do. But always I hear that we have the strongest freedom of speech language in our constitution than anybody. Than not even England, not, nobody can be as free about saying what they want to say under our Constitution. And the point of that is that we have a concept of what we think a fair election is about freedom, which says that everyone has a voice. Everyone should be able to give a message. That nobody, nobody should be restricted from stating their opinion. Now you can get into, well, this is corporations versus individuals. But at the end of the day, the message has to be given by somebody. And to worry about how that message is given or how that message is funded, that's why we're here. That's why everyone's so concerned about this Citizens United decision. When, uh, several years ago, I got redistrict. And Granny D, Doris Haddock, is now in my district in Dublin. Mm -hmm. and Granny D is famous for her pushing for the campaign finance reform. And I remember her calling me up and saying, you know, Representative Hunt, you've got you to help me out here. You've got you to vote for this campaign finance legislation we're going to have in New Hampshire. We're going to restrict on how much a legislator can accept. We got to restrict how the money is being spent. We got to try to figure out some campaign finance and how much, how it costs to an election. I said, Granny, do you understand? In the Hampshire right for the state house, there really is not a lot of money getting spent here. You know, for a hundred, that hundred dollar a year job, it's not that much of a task to spend a lot of money. You know, you, you don't need to spend a lot of money. 
And I said, frankly, if people are being attacked, if you would want to be able to respond to that message and to start worrying about how the money is coming in or how you're going to put that ad together and whether which <laughs> media you're using it in is insane when we talk about the freedom of speech, that everyone should have a, a, a voice. And worst of it is, frankly, we see it in our legislature, and we see it in elections in New Hampshire, and I'm sure it's it became playing well, it's a problem everywhere, which is there's no the, the accountability doesn't exist. If you violate it, you pay a fine. So every candidate I've ever heard, whenever I talk about being attacked or whenever they were in to respond, what do they say to me? They say, I'll just I'll just do it. I'll spend the money. If I have to spend more than I'm allowed to spend, I'll spend it. Because if you lose, you lose. It's not like we're going to have a rerun. We're not going to do election over again if there's a violation. So if it's about getting your message out, you're going to do whatever you can to do the message. But I'm very serious about this asterisk concept. And that is, you can't write a constitutional amendment that says, okay, corporations don't have rights as individuals. If you were to write that simple constitutional amendment, you will have overturned a huge amount of case law. Not just the freedom of speech issue. I maybe you want to narrow it down to the freedom of speech issue. And I, I noticed that Arkansas, in their, their, they had all kinds of things in but that their last thing, they had an exemption to it, which said, oh, but the freedom of press, the newspapers are, are exempt, because they're all corporations, right? But they're exempt. How can you do that? How can you say, okay, one corporation's okay and the other one's not okay? I don't know. As a legislator, I've always said every piece of legislation I see has a grain of truth to it. But the devil is in the details. It's how do you write that? How do you narrow it down? How do you try to get what you're trying to get at without having all kinds of incredible unintended consequences, which we see all the time? The Constitution is about protecting minority rights. That's why we amend the Constitution. We want to the Constitution to focus on how to protect individuals who are not in the majority. That's, that's where we want the Constitution to step up. To go out there and take some obscure little court decision that it really affects very few people, it really very, is affecting very little elections, and say all of a sudden this thing is going to raise itself up to be as important as all our other constitutional amendments. It's a stretch. You know, I've always said that freedom of speech is, is, is ugly. It's not easy. You know, we have pornography, we have flag burning. We have all kinds of speech that people can do. But we believe in it. And it's not something we can ask. It's not something we can say, well, we have some, we're, we're, we have some freedom of speech, but some speech is not free enough. We can't, we're not going to have that speech. And it's so important to me that when we have an election, the election is about getting ideas out. It's about hearing everybody's side of the story. It's not about, okay, well, we're going to pick and choose who we want to hear it from. You know, this idea that corporations are all the evil people here at the table. No, you know, it's not just corporations. It can be a one man, it could be an LLC, it could be a family owned company. It could be anybody. And we're going to just throw them all into it. Say that foreign international corporations are going to suddenly have an impact on our elections. Well, you know what? <laughs> That's just. This is so laughable because, you know, corporations are not going to get behind an ad and have everybody else know that they've paid for this ad and not think that people won't boycott them. Well, people, the people will stop buying their product. You would be offended if you saw some big corporation or some foreign country. I mean, it, it would be, it would be, it would not be to their benefit. And that, and that, you know, just like we have the invisible hand in capitalism, the invisible hand in, in these ads is, you know, is who paid for that ad. And nothing's changed there. We all get to know who paid for these ads. And frankly, when I, when I hear people tell me all the time about how terrible the Koch brothers are and how we've got to do something about them, and I go, so you don't do business with Georgia Pacific or you don't have Scotchgard, right? And it says Scotchgard, don't buy it. And that's Koch brothers. So 
we have the power to do what we what if if we feel a corporation is abusing, and this idea that international you know uh, are going to pour money into our our campaigns is not what this decision was about. But I'll tell you, here's the real reason why I'm almost offended by this constitutional amendment, and that is that I have been targeted. I've had negative campaign. I had four days of relentless negative advertising that came out against me, okay, by an individual. Now, he created a fake pack because he had to because that's a state law, but it was an individual. How was I could sit there and just let it respond when I see all of a sudden everywhere in my town signs, defeat, no new taxes, defeat hunt. When did I ever for a tax? I mean, anybody who knows me, I've never really voted for any taxes. So, but he could say what he wants. He's free to say whatever he wants. But you're saying that somebody would step up and say, listen, John, I want to do an infomercial. I want to do some, a radio ad. And I want to pay for that to tell to get the message across. I have to say, no, you can't do that. We have to find some other way around the law. We got to you know, find some other loophole that, to be able to get that message out. No. If somebody wants to get up and make a statement, they should be allowed to. And I don't care what the nature of their entity. You know, it's almost offensive to you say to your constituents, you don't know how to handle this money that's being spent. You can't make the right decisions. Well, it's just not true. And I would never accuse my constituents of not knowing what they're doing when they vote. And maybe some other politician wants to do that. But I would never say that about my constituents. I think my constituents are very bright and very smart and very informed and know exactly what they're doing when they voted for me. I'm not going to say that they are like they can't handle all that money that that negative campaign. You should see what happened to another, the other woman who was on my ballot. And we were talking about relentless color, blow, it just every day. It was, you know, they, they had, oh, that was the one, one of the pictures they wanted to say how bad she was. They had a picture of Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and her in the middle. Okay? And this was a primary, Republican primary. So assuming that people, Republicans, weren't too crazy about Nancy Pelosi. But, but that's the kind of negative advertising you can get. The voters voted her in. The voters have voted me back when I was named the campaign. The voters are not, not swayed by these campaigns. And um, in terms of, you know, corporations, you know, like I said, they had the balancing act. Uh, the bovine growth hormone was really well fixed, as a matter of fact. It wasn't about telling somebody to write on there that you had bovine growth hormone in it. They just switched it around and said, feel free to advertise you don't have bovine growth hormone. A simple solution. It didn't require the Vermont law. It was simply saying is, if you think that bovine growth hormone is a bad thing, then you go ahead and market yourself. Treat it as a positive, that you don't have that. That's the way marketing should be. That's the way freedom of speech is in America. It's about you putting forward and telling your message and getting your message across. And the message is for everybody. But I'll tell you, back in 1987, when I knew I was going to be in the minority when I voted against that flag burning amendment, resolution and, and as legislators here know I don't vote for resolutions anymore because of that because I think they're they're the legislature is business is making laws for the citizens not by making sending out worthless paper resolutions to tell people what to do let alone what really bothered me about that flight burning was what's the language how are you gonna are you gonna say that it's okay to burn the New Hampshire flag but it's not okay to to burn the stars and stripes. But the thing that was in my head, I just couldn't get out of my head. And often people say Voltaire said it, but it turns out it was actually the woman who wrote something, he wrote, wrote his uh, biography. But he said is, I might not agree with what you say, but I'll fight to death your right to say it. That's what freedom of speech is about. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Mind if I respond? Sure. Here? Uh, so I, I want to start with where I agree with Representative Hunt. Uh, there's a few statements.
statements you made that I want to be clear we agree on. Everyone should have a voice. I agree with that. The Constitution should protect minority rights, the rights of individuals who are not a majority. I agree with that. There should be no asterisk to the First Amendment. I, I, I agree with that. So now, if I can, let me clarify uh, where, where I'm coming from, where many others uh, in this movement are coming from. Uh, first, with respect to the notion that Citizens United had nothing to do with allowing corporations to spend money in elections, I think we need look no further than what Justice Stevens said in his dissent uh, in that opinion. It was a 5-4 ruling, uh, and just to make sure we're all on the same page here, this was a case that originally dealt, as you discussed, with the technical question of how uh, this movie, Hillary, uh, the movie was to be run, whether it could be funded with corporate money, but it was transformed into an entirely different case when the five justices of the Supreme Court held it over for further argument uh, in, the, in the fall of 2009, didn't rule on the merits as had been presented uh, prior to that, and then decided they wanted to review two prior Supreme Court precedent, which under your theory, Representative Hunt, as I understand it, those, those prior Supreme Court rulings were violating the, the First Amendment, violating the precious claim of freedom of speech because both of those prior rulings had made clear that we as people had the authority through our elected representatives to put regulations on what these artificial creatures of state corporations could do with respect to the political process in terms of spending money. One precedent was just six years old at that point. It was a, it was a 2003 precedent known as McConnell v. FEC. And that very Supreme Court uh, that still had a, a conservative majority had upheld uh, the McCain-Feingold law, which was the es essence of what Citizens United ultimately addressed, and, and had upheld the very provision that was being challenged six years later. So they wanted to know, should they overturn that precedent? But more importantly, they, they asked the question in this re-argument, should we overturn a precedent back to 1990 case known as Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce, which had made clear that corporations may not spend money uh, in our elections, that the state of Michigan in that case, or any other state or the federal government, had the authority, uh, with, the, with the people's backing, of course, to bar corporate spending in elections on the grounds that corporations are not people, they're not individuals in the minority to be protected under the Constitution. They are creatures of the state. So Justice Stevens said that this was a radical departure, this Citizens United ruling, was a radical departure from settled First Amendment law. That ruling, that 5-4 uh, ruling, overturned those two prior rulings, swept away a century of press and barring corporate money in elections. And, and Stevens went on uh, to say this, he said the framers uh, took it as a given that corporations could be comprehensively regulated in the service of the public welfare. Unlike our colleagues, referring to the five justices, they had little trouble distinguishing corporations from human beings, and when they constitutionalized the right to free speech in the First Amendment, it was the free speech of individual Americans that they had in mind. And that is really the debate here. It's not about should we deal with the individual right to free speech. Nothing that's being proposed in this constitutional amendment movement is about uh, trying to undermine any way that far, far from it. We're trying to restore the First Amendment to its original purpose. You know, the framers understood the danger of having these creatures of the state corporations engage in our, in our political process. James Madison took, talked of corporations as being a necessary evil subject to proper limitations and, and guards. James Madison being, of course, the author of the First Amendment. Thomas Jefferson said he hoped to crush in its birth the aristocracy of our money and corporations. And for two centuries, for two centuries, the United States Supreme Court and federal courts below that followed the framers' mandate and understood that the First Amendment was not designed to protect 
corporation. So I think you know we're just on that point. We are at a different place because this is not about putting an asterisk to the First Amendment. I also just want to reference the the notion of freedom of the press. It is true that the amendments that we're backing at Free Speech or People and our allies are backing uh, would not. Uh, and, and, and it's been stated very clearly in those amendments, would not impact the freedom of the press. But to be clear, it is not a right that Fox News as a corporation has, or CBS News, or MSNBC. It's the right of people to freedom of the press. So the reporters, the producers, the editors, the readers, the listeners, individual human beings are the ones who have the right to freedom of the press. And that's why we want to ensure that we protect those individual rights. And, and I think that's that's a big distinction here. Uh, you know, with respect to the point that a small LLC could be impacted here, I, you know, I just have to say that, you know, we have 2,000 plus business leaders on board with this amendment fight from across the country, most of whom are small business leaders, because they understand they can't compete up against the large multinational corporation with all the billions uh, that, that they have at their disposal. This is not an anti-business campaign. Far from it. In fact, if anything, Citizens United promotes crony capitalism. It undermines an innovative economy. It undermines a competitive marketplace because it allows the biggest corporate actors to determine what our public policy shall be at the expense of small business owners and at the expense of all of us. Uh, and and that, that, I think, needs to be stated clearly. And that's why so many business leaders have gotten on board. I also have to clarify, there is no disclosure requirement right now for corporations when they spend money in, in campaigns. You say, well, we'll get to know about it, it will be an informed choice. The fact is that because prior to Citizens United, corporations were barred altogether from making expenditures, there's no law on the books to require disclosure. Now, to be fair, there is an effort here in the state legislature to have disclosure. I hope you are backing it to force that kind of disclosure. There's also an effort in Congress to have that disclosure. The Disclose Act has been filibustered in the Senate, but it's passed, uh, you know, uh, in terms of majorities, it's, it's passed. So, you know, we, we do have to get to the point of having an informed choice, but at this point, corporations can spend either directly or indirectly uh, their funds. Now, you're right, a lot of corporations may not want to spend directly because people might go out and boycott. And you know, people may remember that Target Corporation was one of the first to go after uh, Canada in Minnesota uh, after Citizens United. They, they put a lot of money uh, in, that, in that race. And then they got hit with a video attack, uh, which uh, people went into a Target store in Seattle and said, Target ain't people, so why should it be? They get to fool around with our democracy. You know, they put trombones and everybody marched around Target store and it went viral. And millions of people saw the ad. So that's a, that's a good point. But you know what Target did after that? They decided they weren't going to spend any money directly. They're going to funnel it through, you know, disclose C4, 501C4 operations and other kinds of operations. And therefore, we don't really know how many hundreds of millions of dollars will flow in our political process because there is no disclosure, there is no requirement for them to make. Uh, those kinds of uh, disclosures. And I think that's even pernicious as well. Finally, I just want to say, and I know we want to open up for questions here, that there is a long-standing tradition in First Amendment jurisprudence of reasonable time, place, and manner <coughs> regulations on speech. This is not a direct regulation of speech itself, but it's a regulation on the place where we can speak, the amount of time we can speak, the manner we can speak. So let's, let's think of some examples. We cannot stand right next to somebody in a voting booth and say, vote for that person. But, you know, we have to actually be outside the voting place, you know, a certain, certain distance away, and that's where we can stand with our signs, and that's where we can meet people. That's a regulation on the place of speech. We have plenty of examples, including in this debate, although, you know, I could try to filibuster all the way through to the end. We have plenty of examples where we regulate the time of speech. So people on the floor of the House of Representatives in Washington and the Senate and, and maybe in New Hampshire too, there are time restrictions on, on how long you have to speak. And that's a reasonable regulation on the, on the time of speech. And finally, we regulate the manner of speech all the time. And what 
Buckley v. Vallejo did back in 1976, it essentially said that those who have the biggest megaphones, those who are wealthy, uh, you know, with all the funds available, can drown out the voices of ordinary citizen speech. And what we're talking about with this amendment effort is to get to a level playing field. This isn't about you or anyone else not being able to respond, but it's that all of us are on a level playing field, that if there's an expenditure from an independent group and you need to respond, fine, but at a certain point, we ought to have a cap. We ought to have a limit on what all of us can spend. And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of public funding of elections as well, but beyond, that's not needed for, an amendment is not needed for that, but let's have voices from those who don't even have the funds to spend, let's have their voices heard as well. Do you want to respond in absolutely. a couple minutes absolutely. and then we want to open it up? for the whole point of disclosure. I mean, I, I, yes, I'm absolutely a very strong supporter of disclosure. And that is the, that you want to back off this idea of telling who can't do it, how you can do it, and say, is, yes, it should be a free-for-all. Yes, everyone wants to say their message. Everyone has an opportunity to get up on that soapbox and say what they want to say. And that, that your attempt to somehow... Uh, well, let's, let's squeeze this down because these people have too much money and therefore they have too much power to get their message across. Show me where that's happened in the elections. I can't tell you how many times I've seen elections where money was spent galore by, by one side that lost. There okay. are exceptions to the rule, okay. Representative. Well, I, I don't know. But, but here's the point. Here's the point is that, is, is that is when you, you're taking, you're, you're creating a cause and effect, some kind of direct line. Last time I checked, corporations don't even have a right to vote. Okay, so if the issue is Watch that the voters are confused, right now. okay, if the voters are confused about what they're doing, all right, <laughs> I've said I I don't that's just wrong. You can't say that. You can't say. I mean, it, it's sort of it's you know they say oh uh, we know better. The voters really don't understand how that all that <laughs> negative advertising affected them and made their decision. Maybe that negative advertising was just saying what they really believed anyways. You know, maybe the voters, well, you've got to trust the voter to know what they're doing. You know, for years, I always used to hear how outrageous it was what was going on in corporations is that they were bundling their donations. That they go around and every, every key employee wrote out the $2,500, whatever the maximum amount of check is, wrote the dollar amount of check out, and they bundled them all together, and they gave it all to the candidate and say, okay, it's legal. All right? I personally... I, as far as I know, we absolutely have disclosure. When you write that check, we know exactly what corporations you write for. And as a matter of fact, you go on the web, and I'm always amazed to see where that you know checks that I write out, even you know a couple hundred dollar check to a candidate, and there it is on the internet. All right, it's all out there, and it absolutely says where who you work for. So the issue is not trying to fix elections by uh, controlling the money and controlling what pe the message people have. It should be completely opposite. The whole point of the freedom of speech is, is that we want everyone to have a voice. And we don't want to say, this and kind of get into this, uh, well, you know, t uh, uh, television or newspapers, they have employees who are, are voicing that message. Now, come on. The editorial staff is going to make sure that the, edit the, the, uh, the message they get across is the message they want. Okay? They're not going to tell the employee, oh yeah, go ahead. The union leader is not going to suddenly have some, you know, you know, editorial, you know, employees or editorial staff that's going to suddenly do something different than what their agenda is. All right? We know the newspapers have agendas. We know networks have their agendas. And the idea to say is, oh, that, but that's okay. That agenda is fine. They can go and say whatever they want. Get on. They can run all the ads they get on. But hey, the voters know that, right? The voters know that Fox is right wing and. <laughs> and MSNBC is left wing, so we don't have to worry about that. No, that's wrong. The point is, everyone should have an opportunity to speak. Don't sweat how people speak. Don't sweat what they speak. Just have faith in the voter. <laughs> have faith that people do know what they're voting for. Okay, um, I'd like to yeah, just start ahead. with the yeah. question, and then I'd yeah. like to open it up to the audience. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that you said is you don't, you know. You don't care what people, voters don't care what negative ads are said, you know, about a candidate. They're going to make their own choice based on what they think about that candidate, um, and and th that's not going to influence them. 
One of the things that I'm interested, though, particularly just in my experience when I worked in the Senate, is I think there's also another side to this. It's not just about what happens before the election. It's not just about what is said about someone before the election, but it's also about access. Um, and so to the extent that um, members of Congress have very limited time, um, who gets in to see members and who gets in to see staff? That whole mystery of access and the ability to influence voter, voting um, decisions by members, um, just in my limited experience um, working in the Senate, um, people who had given contributions to members but on both sides of the aisles had much easier access to those members, whether that would meant the senator or congressman would pick up the phone or have a staff make a meeting. And so I just want to talk a little bit about sort of how um, that plays into this debate as well. Thank you, Erin. I think that's a critical point. I mean, I think it is true that those who are giving large sums of money to the political campaigns have more access than ordinary citizens. And, uh, you know, we see it in terms of the kind of policies uh, that come out of Washington. I mean, we have gridlock, it's true, on a lot of issues of the day, but part of the reason why we have that gridlock is because the major corporate and big money interests don't want to see advancement on single payer health care or a living wage or better, you know, renewable energy opportunities. Uh, and, and that's because of the power <coughs> in, in various instances of big money and, and corporate America. But, you know, I think it is. Uh, not accurate to say that the movement that's calling for systemic change here doesn't trust the voters. In fact, if anything, this movement is made up of the majority of, of the country. Uh, poll after poll shows is ready for reasonable limits on campaign spending, is ready for public funding of elections, is ready for strong disclosure, and is ready for an amendment. So this isn't about somehow you know, this movement is counter to the, to the will of the people. It, it, I think the will of the people is for a government of, by, and for the people and not have big money interests drown out our voices. Uh, but I also think it's critical to look at these races and understand that there is very little competition today in most federal races for public office, for, for Senate office or for congressional office. You know, John Rao is here in the back. He's the founder and president of Americans for Campaign Reform. He's gone all over the country talking about this danger we have today in our country where we have a lack of debate, like we're having here tonight, because we don't really have real contested elections. That's why he's been pushing, and I've been a proud uh, board member and now advisory board member of Americans for Campaign Reform, proud because he's been pushing for a level playing field, public funding elections that will give people more of an opportunity to get their voices heard. And Senator Warren Rudman, by the way, was co-chair of Americans for Campaign uh, Reform. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's just not accurate to say that this is about not trusting the voters. The voters want competition. They want a vibrant debate on our uh, ideas of, our, uh, of, of what's happening with our government. And, what people want to run for. And it may be that, you know, Representative Hunt, to be fair to you, maybe you've had competition in every single race you face. I, I, I'll, I'll grant you that. I don't know your, your background in terms of your prior races. But if you take a look at the statistics on this, you're the exception to the rule if that's the case. Because the fact is that in most races, there is not real competition. And the further exception to the rule is uh, that, that somehow the money doesn't matter. Uh, most cases, in fact, those who outspend their opponent go on to win election 93% of the time. If you're running for a congressional seat in this country, you first have to raise and spend the most money to go on to win. That's a, that's a fact. That's a statistic. Senate side, it's 85 plus percent. So money does matter. Uh, and it's not about not trusting the voters. It's about that the other candidates don't even have the opportunity to get their voice heard and their supporters heard because their voices get drowned out. You know what was interesting is that she was posing the question was uh, access to a candidate to someone who was elected, and but you said something that I thought was really important: how many people write checks to both sides, to both candidates? Okay, I would venture to say is the issue is not when a elected official meets with people; it's not so much oh that person gave a hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to clear my schedule, I'm going to listen to that person. 
The odds are the reason why that person gave $100,000 is they support their positions. So you absolutely, as an elected official, you absolutely want to meet with those constituents, constituents who support you. Okay? And so, you know, let's take this survey you keep talking about. Let's rephrase the survey. Do you think it's okay that trade unions would be able to run a one-minute commercial 60 days prior to an election? Well, I bet you a lot of people say, yeah, I think that is probably okay. All right? So you keep saying it's corporations. It's just international. It's multinational corporation. You know, it's all the way you phrase the question. Let's phrase the question as, you know, can, can, can a nonprofit be able to, to take on, a, uh, you know, do a, uh, a five-minute news, you know, news clip or whatever? And, and run that, most people say, well, that's probably okay. But you know, you don't, you don't ask the question that way. So you get the answer you want. The fact is, my constituents don't want campaign finance reform. They, they, don't, want, they don't want us to, you know, we are one of the least tax states in the union, and the last thing they would want us to do is spend government money on funding candidates, okay? And, and I think it's ironic, this last election, the two presidential candidates, both of them, waved off on doing the finance reform. You know, why? Because if you want to spend the money on the camp on the election that you can win, you want to focus your election. You want to focus on you. Know, you spend the money on those states you can win. Now that we're talking about it, we narrowed it down to well, it was like six or seven states that really made the election. You say, well, that's that's the problem. There's no serious race going on. Well, that's because we've done a great job of you know someone said gerrymandering, but you know we do a great job of making sure our districts are protected. And yes, I come from a town. Rinch is very conservative, so um, you know the, the I did have one election. I did I did barely win. I, you know, but by 67 votes, okay, 10 percent. You know, but but it was a serious election. And you know, frankly, it wasn't about how much money we spend. It wasn't about what our message was. It was that everybody in town knew both of us, and it's just a matter of who they voted for, who was the most popular person. Okay, and I just happened to, you know, you know, not that I, I think more people, I mean, more people knew her than me, but more people, you know, said, okay, uh, we're, he's been doing this for 10 years, so we're okay with him. Okay, it's so much a popularity contest elections now. In terms of raising money, absolutely you raise lots of money. Absolutely, it's absolutely sickening. We read the newspaper, it's all about, well, we know he's not a viable candidate because he hasn't raised any money yet. You hear that all the time. Well, maybe that is a methodology to find out whether people really think your candidacy is, is viable or not. It's not. That's not a bad way to measure your, your way you're getting your message across, rather than taking surveys and calling up people on the phone and say, do you know who so-and-so is? And, and when you vote for another person, most of the time, you see most of them is, I have no idea who that candidate is. I haven't even heard that name before. And that, you know, so the idea that money is poison politics I, I, is, is like, I guess it's come from now, the latest, where it, we are so much more polarized now in our elections and things are, are much more mag magnified. But, you know, it's always been a problem. Play, you know, people were always saying negative things about other. I mean, the whole suggestion acts way back when, when Adams and Jefferson, and they were, they were saying that, that they're, you know, you know, throwing their wives, you know, saying negative things about their wives, and, or not the wife, or whatever. So I mean, negative campaign has always been there. Newspapers the, at that time was the only medium they know, know, knew of. I mean, I don't even think they, don't, they didn't even have direct mail back then. So to say is, oh, they had no idea, no vision to, to know what, what freedom of speech was going to turn into. I think we say that about half our constitutional amendments. They had no idea what it was going to turn into. But I do think, I really truly believe, when we talk about what makes America, what makes our, our democracy so great, is the freedom of speech. Okay, any questions from the audience? Uh, sir, right there. You? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. This is a statistic that I just discovered in the last few days, and it shocks the conscience. 132 Americans funded 60% of super PAC spending in election 2012. That's point zero 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 four two percent of Americans funded a super majority of super PAC spending used to influence our elections. Would each of you comment? Did Bluebird spend three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to overturn 
the to recall elections in the Senate? He did. He, he did it in Colorado recently. Yeah, and yeah. what happened? Well, he may, got not, recalled, he right? may so not have prevailed, but he, what he caused was a huge skyrocketing of the cost of those elections because of that. I mean, this is not, again, represented upon a partisan divide here. There are Republicans who are on board saying we need to put overall limits on campaign spending uh, and, and public funding and disclosure. And there are people on the Democratic side who engage in, in major spending. And then there's, you know, independent billionaire Mayor Bloomberg who wants to go out and do this. So this isn't about... I didn't we, say it was partisan. I never say partisan. Well, well, but the point here is that, you know, there are going to be checks going to both sides, but that's not, I think, what Representative Perry's question goes to. What Representative Perry is highlighting is you have a very small, finite percentage of the overall population participating in this process of big money dominance of our elections because they're able to because they have the resources to do so. You know, your example of, well, maybe it's a good measure of popular support. Let's, let's put out this hypothetical. The mic for is off. The mic is off. Yeah. People oh, well. can hear me? I think it's still, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Let's put out, let, let's put out this example of, of popular support. Let's say, Representative Hunt, that you have a thousand people who support you and each of whom can only give you one dollar. And I'm running against you, and I only have 10 people who support me, but they give me $1,000 each. Is that a good measure of popular support that I can outspend you 10 to 1? I, I, don't, I don't think that that's going to be a good measure of popular support. I think what is a better measure of popular support is ensuring that all voices get heard, regardless of your access to wealth. So, so back to Representative Perry's point, you know, we shouldn't allow the multimillionaires and the major corporate interests to be able to spend their money at a level that drowns out the voices of everyone else. And, and that's why Senator Udall uh, from New Mexico has introduced a constitutional amendment to overturn Buckley to allow for reasonable campaign spending limits. He has 24 U.S. Senators on board. That's why, uh, you know, in prior votes where this Senate amendment, this constitutional amendment has come up, Senator John McCain has voted for it. Uh, you know, and other Republicans have voted for it, and, and I think that's important uh, change that needs to occur to restore the First Amendment to the people. But also, we need to deal with this pernicious doctrine of corporate constitutional rights that goes beyond the campaign finance sphere and, and, and goes into these other areas that I highlight. It's not just the bovine growth hormone drug example. Monsanto's using it again now with GMO uh, labeling. Uh, we've seen a case come out of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals that struck down a National Labor Relations Board notice where uh, the notice was providing workers the right to understand, the right to organize, the right to strike and so forth. And uh, you, you know, National Associated Manufacturers went after the National Labor Relations Board and said, well, we have a free speech right not to put that notice uh, on our walls. You know, we don't have to inform people about these basic rights. That's the kind of use of this pernicious doctrine that goes outside of the campaign finance context. But I, I do think it's important to understand that you know we're not talking about the vast majority of people participating uh, in this campaign finance process. We're talking about a finite percentage of the population that have, have the money to do so, and that's the danger here. You know, you keep confusing ability to raise money or have money as a direct correlation to whether you win the election or not. There is no, you, you cannot document, you can't prove that. You know, I've seen candidates who raised all kinds of money and they didn't even get out of the primary. They lost in the primary. There are so exceptions they were, they were, to the No, 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 this is, I'm telling you. Just because you can raise money does not mean you have the right message, okay? You know, maybe, okay, maybe this is where I'm gonna be partisan. Why do we keep thinking that we can pass laws that are enforceable, that are going to really control, contain the way people spend money, okay? Every time you pass something, people are gonna find the loophole around it. And this, is, this, is, this thing is just a little minor, but I mean, I know that you know, Justice Stevens think this is, this is catastrophic, but I did not see any corporations running any ads this last election. I, I, I mean, I saw a little packs, and, and my understanding, the Citizen United, this is just some, some guy who had, had it out for Hillary. 
He had it out for Hillary back when, when he was an aide for some for someone in Congress. I mean, once that once people got saw the ad, saw these things that he was running on Hillary, and, and then knew, you know, and the newspapers or whatever the reporters would say, and by the way, this guy had, was chasing after her when she was the first lady and was trying to, you know, trash her back then. You know, the voters would disregard it. They would think they would it'd be laughable. You know, you've got to have faith in the voters. You've got to know that just because people spend outrageous amounts of money does not mean that they have the right message. At the end of the day, people are going to vote for who they think is the right person. They're not, they're not going to get bogged down on commercials. I mean, it, and, l and like I say, it, it's, it's just the money is being spent doesn't mean that the message is, is a worthy message. You know, and, and more importantly, you cannot really control how much money people spend. There are so many different ways of spending money. There's so many different mediums that are out there. Um, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're kidding yourself by thinking that if we could just pass this one law, this is one right <coughs> law, this is gonna fix everything. It's not. And, and I think you're better off sticking to disclosure, sticking to issues that we can address, that are, that are, that are something that you can enforce, rather than trying to you know, chase, chase the money. Anyway, here. The concern I have isn't just about elections. It's about what happens after the elections. If we take a look at the Senate's banking committee, the amount of money that the people sitting on that banking committee have received from the banks in their campaigns, that's the kind of access that I think is actually worse than just in the elections and the primaries. Because they're writing checks to both candidates. That's not the. Uh, well, and, and, and I'll tell you my personal, my own personal opinion on that. Okay, for years I've never ran. Uh, I've never I've run an uncontested. Okay, and and the one time I was a Republican, Democrat, and a Libertarian because we used to allow that on the ballot. I think Chuck got rid of that. <laughs> but uh, when I finally had an election, when somebody was running against me, and the checks started coming in, and he said, "Well, look at the look who's writing him checks, bankers." Okay. Well, yeah, I sit on the banking committee. Why are they sending me checks? Well, because they've seen what I've done in the last ten years, and they're happy with what I've done. Are we going to take away from what they're what they what they perceive? They're saying is yes. You were you. We want you to get reelected. We're happy with you as chairman of that committee. So yes, they're sending you checks. And they say that's bad. That's evil. No, that's their right to express their opinion about the candidate, and, and that's why, of course, they all send them as individuals. Right? They couldn't write out, you know, couldn't be the bank itself. But yeah, there were bank officers who were sending me checks because they were happy with what I was doing. They wanted me to be reelected. Is that I, a bad I, thing? I think the point that is trying to be made is that there's undue influence by the banking sector upon the votes of those individuals that are sitting on that committee. Because you're saying it's a quid pro quo. You're saying it's, well, because I have the check, I'm going to now do what you want to do. And I okay? think that does happen. There are plenty of times that I did not do what they wanted to do. Okay? There are times when just because someone gave me a check did not mean I'm going to follow and I through think New Hampshire The auto dealers sent me lots of checks this last election because they wanted to pass the special le legislation this session for just them. And I voted against them. New Hampshire is unique in that we have very small districts, we get no money, and there's an entirely different ball game in Washington. So it's very different comparing apples in New Hampshire to the rotten oranges in Washington. <laughs> okay, that's okay. But I would say it's a chicken and the egg. Is, are they getting the checks because of who they are and what they stand for? Or are you saying this, you know, that, you know, and I'm not, I mean, they get the checks on both sides anyways. They, they give checks to everybody. And hoping that you know, you know, make sure they get they get the access for both people. But at the end of the day, the reality is that you know, you you if the candidate is doing what you want them to do, you know, chicken on the egg, what came first? Okay, I'll take the question back there, and then over here. Yeah, uh, Representative, let's let's accept your premise for a second. Let's say that they are 142 people are sending 60% of the PAC money in support of the candidates they favor, and they do not expect access, and they don't expect in any way to influence the vote after it has been made. We'll assume all that. So everything you say is true. Is it a democracy when 142 people get to look at the field of candidates and say, this person would be best for me? 
And I don't really care about the other 300 million. Did they win the election? Evidently, Barack Obama won. So he spent all that money for nothing, didn't they? Can I, can I clarify that? I mean, the fact is that President Obama had a lot of super PAC money back at him, too. So also. this is not about, you know, somehow looking at the race and saying, oh, the super PAC money lost. There is, you know, uh, an example of, of someone uh, who spent a lot of money and, and didn't prevail in his races. But the fact is, is that a lot of the super PAC money did prevail in that it set the agenda for what gets discussed. I mean, to the banking committee point, you know, yeah, checks go to both sides. But I'll tell you where checks aren't going. Checks aren't going to making sure that Wall Street gets held accountable for the fiscal crisis we've been put into uh, since the 2008 bailout. That's the checks on They're not in public office either, either side. So th again, when I, when I talk about it not being partisan, I'm serious about it. You know, this isn't about saying, well, Democrats are, are not able to get their voice through. No, no, there, there are corporatist Democrats in the United States Congress, and there are corporatist Republicans. And you know what? They're the ones controlling the agenda right now in terms of what our federal government does. And the voices of ordinary citizens don't get heard. There is a recent study out showing that the top 1% of the population in this country has more wealth, earned more wealth last year uh, than any other time in our history since 1928. We have a huge gap, equality gap, when it comes to our economy today. And that is part and parcel connected to the policies that come out of Washington that favor the rich, the wealthiest few, and corporate America. And, and I think that's what people are so upset about. They don't, they don't see that their voices are, are getting heard. And you know, I, I think that it's really critical that we both look at what happens leading up to the election in terms of who gets to run, because you, know, you, you cite examples of people who got outspent and they still won. But I'm telling you, the facts show, the facts show that 93% of the time, if you're running for the United States Congress, you have to outraise your opponent in order to win. And 85% of the time, if you're running for the US Senate, you have to outraise your opponent in order to win. Those are the facts. And, 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 you, can't, and you can't highlight the exceptions to say the facts don't matter. Yeah, but you can't say, OK, if we could just squeeze that money down, you're going to get a different result. You're making an assumption that there's no evidence of. You're making an assumption that, that if we just if we just cut all this money down, if we just say, okay, each candidate can spend, you know, what do we have? So one dollar and fifty cents per citizen. You know, what we have in our, per constituent. Six dollars. Oh, six now. Oh, I started one dollar. <laughs> but you know, that if we could limit, if we just limit to how much they spend, we're going to have a better result with your election. Well, you know what? Actually, we don't have to make this up. We can look at some examples. In the state of Maine, in the state of Arizona, in the state of Connecticut, there is public funding available for candidates. Now, it's not mandatory limits, and it would be better if it were mandatory limits and we had Senator Udall's amendment bill get enacted. But even in those states that have experimented with voluntary public funding, where candidates have to abide by spending limits in order to take the public funding, most candidates are taking the public money. People are running for office who never would have dreamed of running for office before. You see legislators, legislators in Maine, and Arizona, and Connecticut, and these states engaged in public policy debates that haven't occurred in the past. Uh, and you know, you have Republicans taking the public money. So you are have they Democrats winning or losing? The public money. Are they winning or losing? Well, when you have public money, it's not about the private interest being heard because it's the public, the we the people, owning the process. You know, we own our public streets, we own our public schools, we own our public parks. We ought to own our public elections. And that means having them be publicly financed, and it means reasonable spending limits on what can uh, go into the process from outside groups as well as from the very wealthy. Who the Citizen United's decision is about how someone gets their message out. That's what this decision is about. And you're saying is we don't like the idea that it's a corporate entity running an infomercial. That's all this decision was about. It didn't say anything about whether, you know, uh, uh, whether a, a person could have run that infomercial. Okay, we're going to have the next question. Right there. Uh, you sort of segued into a point I wanted to make about the voters. In my experience, what and we have a terrible record with voter turnout, and it's, it's embarrassing, the lack of involvement. And I, I would like you to speak to whether or not it has to do with money, because what I'm hearing from my smart voters is they're really tired of all the money that's being spent on the kind of advertising which doesn't really talk to policy and ideas and, and real substantive issues.
answer that. It's not, a, it's not about who's popular. It should be about whose ideas are going to move our, our, ourselves forward. Right. And, and people are tired of all the money because they don't feel that that is adding. They feel it's detracting from regular people, you know, getting public finance and getting, getting the message. Yeah. See, see my constituent, and I, I know we're, you know, we're on the other side of the state, so I'm like, but it, when I ask someone who doesn't vote, I'll say, why didn't you vote? And you know what they say? I've never heard them say, well, because there's too much money in it. You know what they always say to me is? I have no idea who I'm voting for. I don't know the candidates. I know the president. The money. That's my point. No, that's no, complete opposite. I'm saying this, we're not spending enough money. We need, we need more empowerment to get your message out. You need to give opportunity for people to get, that's my whole point of freedom of speech. That's why we want more money in campaigns. We want more people to have an opportunity so you do get to the voter. The vast majority of the voters will say, this, well, I don't read that one newspaper, so I don't know any of the candidates. I, I look at that ballot, I know, you know, I know President, I've heard a little bit about the other ones because I watch Channel 9, but when you get down to our place, they have no idea. How many people on your ballot? Like nine, six, how many people were on your ballot? You got all those different names on that ballot. Okay, well, I couldn't read this. <laughs> but, you know, in the old days, it wasn't there like nine people? Yeah. And how would you ever know we're all nine people, let alone 18 people? No, we need more money to be spent. We need more opportunity for people to know who these candidates are. My point was we're that people are disengaging money. from the process because the money is a distraction. I'll just answer that, you know, when you take a look at these studies, and by the way, these aren't surveys that we conduct. I'm not a public opinion specialist. We uh, contracted with Peter Hart, who happens to be a very well-respected public opinion researcher who does work for the Wall Street Journal and NBC News. And he took on this project for us, and he created the questions, and he uh, tested them both pro and con, and, and I think did it very fairly. And if anyone wants to take a look at the, the study themselves, they can go to our website at freespeechforpeople.org and check it out. But those kinds of studies have shown, both Peter Hart's and others, that people do disengage. They talk about it in these studies, how they find it uh, you know, discouraging and, 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 and really undermining of their voice when so much money is coming in that drowns out uh, their ability to be heard. And that's why they do disengage. And they also disengage, I have to say, when there's no competition. How you does don't money have, drown you don't have How does money drown people out? I don't get that. How does money drown with someone? With bad ads. But, but you're assuming that the people are buying into those bad ads. Well, let me, that's let me, an let assumption. Let me give you, let me give you, let me you give have you. evidence that people are really buy everything that's bad at? You're oh, that means you think the voter really is uneducated and doesn't have enough opportunity to know where the real issues are. Here's one way that money drowns people out. If you're an incumbent in the United States Congress today, you have a huge war chest by definition. You're told by your party leaders, go out and raise money every day. They walk off <coughs> from their capital, they're supposed to at least, walk off from their <coughs> capital office and go into a little cubby hall somewhere in their party headquarters a block away and they dial for dollars to random strangers around the country asking for maximum donations from the wealthiest few of our country. That's what they're doing with our taxpayer funded time. They're, they're going off and doing that and they're doing it on the Democratic side and Republican side and they're doing it in the U.S. Congress and they're doing it in the U.S. Senate. And you know what that does? It automatically shuts out competition because if you have that incumbent war chest, millions of dollars already built up how many people have the ability to take on somebody who's got that incumbent power already and those millions of dollars? That's how it drowns out the voices because we don't actually get that competition because the only people who can take on those kinds of, of, of incumbents who have that kind of war chest are wealthy candidates themselves or those who have an enormous ability to raise large sums of money. And that's the kind of competition we see if we see it all today. It's a money race. It's a money race and, and the ordinary citizen is left out. I always want to give a law student a chance. So, Chad, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I'm curious to hear about the specifics of the constitutional amendment that's been proposed. What would the caps be, and how would the caps be enforced? Yes, so uh, it's an important question. The question of what, what does the amendment uh, propose to do with respect to reasonable campaign spending limits, what would the caps be, and how would the caps be enforced? Senator Udall's constitutional amendment a bill which we support, which can be accessed via our site, freespeechforpeople.org, uh, and there's also a flyer you can take downstairs more about this. His amendment bill uh, would, would provide Congress and the states the authority 
to enable, to, to enact campaign spending limits. It doesn't actually set what those limits should be. That's up for Congress to decide or in the case of state legislatures for them to decide. It's not a, 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 an amendment that prescribes directly what that limit is to be. That's really to be done via statute. But what it does do is it overturns this flawed ruling from 1976, which set us on this course of our elections being auctions for the highest bidder and allows for reasonable spending limits. And it, it's important to understand that you know this, this case out of 1976 came about because of the Watergate scandal. There was a series of reforms passed by Congress in the wake of the Watergate scandal that included mandatory limits on overall uh, congressional campaign spending. And that went directly up to the Supreme Court on a fast track without any real uh, you know, facts being developed because cans weren't even running under those limits. And that's what the court struck down. Uh, so what Senator Udall's amendment bill would be is to return to Congress and the state through we the people the authority to set these spending limits. The other amendment bill that's been introduced by Senator John Tester of Montana uh, with Congressman Jim McGovern of Massachusetts who's co-sponsored both of these <coughs> amendment bills that would make clear that corporations are not people with constitutional rights and restore democracy in our constitution to the people. Okay, one question here, and then we'll do one last question in the back. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to just preface this by saying I think it's a mistake in New Hampshire to talk about the House of Representatives. I think we should talk about the Senate when it comes to access and big money. But my question is this. You went back all the way to, I think, 1990. And some of us have gone back to 1886. Yeah. And then some of us have also gone back to particularly Montana in, to, in 1910, yes. which banned corporate expenditure, and which apparently was reaffirmed by the Montanians recently. Correct. And what is the connection? Um, you know, how come state governments don't have some supremacy on this issue? Uh, because I don't believe that it's a free speech issue. I think it's that those corporations don't have belly buttons. For yeah, they don't vote. Yeah, hey, that's my line. So uh, it's an excellent, <laughs> excellent question from Representative Weed. So, so first, it is true that back in 1886, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a case known as Santa Clara County v. Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, has uh, been interpreted as saying that corporations are people with due process rights under the Equal Protection Clause of the uh, of the Constitution. It was a railroad taxation case. Uh, but, but it has been made clear by Tom Hartman and others. The, the fact is, is that the text of the ruling never stated uh, that the corporations are people with due process rights. It was put in the head notes, and the head notes were written by the clerk of the court, who happened to be a former railroad executive. <laughs> Very convenient. Uh, and yet that, that decision was followed subsequently in, in rulings since 1886 until the New Deal era when this doctrine of corporate constitutional rights became dormant and really was no longer being exercised before Lewis Powell resurrected it under the First Amendment. He became Justice Lewis Powell, I should have said to make clear to everyone. He became an architect on the Supreme Court of this doctrine with a vigorous dissent of Justice Rehnquist, among others, every time one of those cases came before the court. Justice Rehnquist did not believe the corporation should be treated as people with constitutional rights. With respect to Montana, you're absolutely right that Montana and other states have had a long tradition of banning corporate money elections going far beyond 1990, and it was a 1910 law, the Montana Corrupt Practices Act, that was at stake in that case. And, and, and it's worth noting here that the Attorney General, now Governor of Montana, Steve Bullock, went before Congress right after Citizens United, and he testified that their law that was a century old would be defended uh, you know, in the courts, that he was not going to let it go because of Citizens United, and that there were different facts for the people of Montana as to why that law was put in place. It was put in place because of the copper barons of that era having such control over Montana government uh, that the people said it was time to restore democracy to the people and control, uh, you know, this influence of corporate money in our elections back in 1910. And for a century, for a century, Montanans enjoyed elections without corporate money directly going into elections. And then came Citizens United, and then came an attack on all these different state laws. And of the 24 states that banned corporate money elections, 23 folded automatically. They didn't even put up a fight. But thanks to Attorney General Bullock, uh, he did put up a fight. And he got the Montana Supreme Court to rule in December of 2011 in a case that we 
participated in and helped defend uh, before the Montana Supreme Court a 5-2 to two ruling upholding that century-old law making clear that the facts were different and that the Supreme Court should take a look, the U.S. Supreme Court should take a look at those facts and understand why that century-old law should remain enforced. And then it went before the U.S. Supreme Court very quickly, as you I'm sure know, and without even looking at the facts, without even looking at the facts, the five justices summarily reversed, which means they didn't even have a hearing on the merits, they didn't even have briefing on the question, they just reversed the state Supreme Court, they reversed state sovereignty traditionally around controlling elections, and they used this fabricated argument that the corporate speech trumps the people's right to have free and fair elections in the state of Montana. And that's really what's at stake here. It is a complete misnomer to say that the First Amendment is on the side of artificial creatures of the state. It's on the side of we the people. Okay, one last question and then I think we'll adjourn. Uh, years ago, um, I did like an investigation on a local election down in Florida. And the way they were doing it was like a <coughs> poor family donated their money. And then what they did was under each individual's you know, the wife, the husband, and the kids. And then what they did is they donated money under you know, they were owners, they had a bank, they donated money. Then under their property, they had donated money. Under this other business, they donated money. And under this other business, they donated money. And this is similar to what I see here with the Citizens United. It's like the Koch brothers, they can donate a boatload of money here, and then they'll donate another boatload of money under Scotch Guard, another boatload of money under Coca-Cola Company, and under each one of their other corporations too. And this, you know, it's just uh, various ways where it spiders out and becomes more money, whereas the smaller people are just more disenfranchised. You know, who can't afford it, those on fixed incomes. They're just cast a vote. You know, they can't pay for the propaganda that some of the other people have to hear that's going to swing their vote, you know, for whatever, whatever situation. You know, I was just wondering if there's anything to, to you know, on regulation of that, on, on how these the spider web effect of that donations go. I mean, that's why it doesn't work. Because you, at the end of the day, you pass whatever law you pass, whatever rule you're going to make, people will find the ways around it. They'll always find the loopholes. You know, and that's why I'm saying you got to stop kidding yourself that you think you can control freedom of speech, freedom of, of spending money on campaigns. And, and all you say is, I think, I, I think that we keep trying to connect these dots. It seems so simple to you. It's, oh, oh, it's just common sense. Well, it isn't that common sense. For the average voter, the average people who are voting, they tune out this stuff. They, I mean, I'll tell you, I remember a time I've done a direct mailing, and I walk in and I, and I look at the mailbox, you know, the PO box, the whole garbage can is full of the political stuff. People don't even read it. They take, throw it right out. They already know who they're going to vote for. They already know what they want to do. That stuff, you can spend all the money in the world. You're not going to change someone's opinion when they know where they stand on the issue. What they say? really need to know is what the candidates stand for, what the, what the issues are. And, and frankly, the only way a candidate can get that message out is to advertise. But if you rely on the press, the freedom of the press, they can say whatever they want to say, you have to trust them. And when they give you air time, or when you, they, when you can get in, get to space, you know, the candidates, if they want access, they want to have the ability to get their message out. And the idea that we're going to pick and choose the medium, and that's all this is about. This is not about corporations writing out checks to candidates. The Supreme Court did not rule on that. This is about the medium. This is about how the message was presented. It's really, it, it's so minor. It's so, I mean, it, it's like taking a sledgehammer to fix a molehill when you want to say, oh, well, this is, you know, but now I've learned this is all about anti-corporations, that corporations are evil. No, well, I, you know, I'm not saying that at all, Representative Hunt. You misheard me if you think I'm saying corporations are evil. And the 2,000 plus business leaders who are on board with us who own corporations, they're not saying corporations are evil. This is actually about making sure that we have an innovative economy, making sure we have a competitive marketplace, as well as making sure 
that voices of ordinary citizens who don't own corporations get heard as well. And, and, and to get back to the questioner's point, you know, this is not a panacea. The, the idea of a constitutional amendment is not going to solve all these problems. But what's important is that we have the authority as people through our elected representatives in Congress and the state legislatures to set overall limits on what can be spent in elections, including what can be spent by independent groups. And uh, if that includes public funding of elections as well, that, that we have the authority to, to do that. And that we have the authority to make clear that we control these artificial creatures of the state. We allow them to exist. I mean, I want to be clear on this. Corporations don't have a right to exist. It's a privilege that's given by every state corporate charter law. You have to get a corporate charter from a state in order to be a corporation. And you have certain uh, responsibilities that come with that. And then you have certain benefits that we as people don't have. Limited liability, perpetual life, the ability to aggregate wealth and distribute wealth. And for those reasons, we treat them differently than people. So you know, this isn't about being anti-corporate. Far from it. I think, you know, if anything, the constitutional amendment fight is a pro-business uh, campaign because it's about ordinary citizen voices, small businesses, all of us having a level playing field. And, and, I, and I just want to say, you know, there's a vibrant fight here happening in the state of New Hampshire to become the 17th state to sign on. Uh, and in just three years, we've seen enormous movement in this country, across the country, uh, across the political spectrum with respect to this uh, fight. And, and we're not that far from New Hampshire becoming the 17th state. A majority of those in the House of Representatives have signed a letter to Congress urging for this amendment. And, and we're, two, we're two signatures shy in the U.S. Senate. I'm sorry, in the, in the New Hampshire Senate. We're two signatures shy from getting a majority of the Senate to sign on. Uh, so New Hampshire can become the, the 17th state here. And there's going to be a new effort that Olivia Zink and the Coalition for Open Democracy and Public Citizen and Free Speech for People and others are going to help push forward to get local town resolutions passed throughout the state of New Hampshire to call on the state legislature to take this action. It happened in Vermont, and you had dozens of, of town resolutions getting passed. It happened in Massachusetts, and you had dozens of town meeting resolutions get passed. In the spirit of democracy, it's time that we, we do it again, uh, and, and New Hampshire is the place to do it and to become the 17th state. And if you want to sign up to learn more and to be part of this campaign, there's flyers downstairs near the reception for you to do that. And we hope you'll all join and in this historic fight. On a, on a humorous note, just because we have a constitutional amendment <coughs> put forward doesn't mean we'll all sign on. Remember, the Equal Rights Amendment failed. <laughs>